If you're interested in what I look like in real life and want to learn more about me, then follow my Instagram page at Joe the Insomniac. This happened to us two years ago. We, being myself, my daughter, and father, lived in a double shared house. This incident took place over a span of a month, so one day, we decide to walk to the store, as it's close to the house and a nice day. When we came back, we noticed somebody's tried to pry our locks off the doors. There were two obvious dents and blue marks, and a whole big footprint on our doors front and back. Someone wanted in bad. I have no idea why. We have nothing of major value living in the hood. We were gone for less than 20 minutes, so we're on edge. The person could still be around. Now after this, so many bizarre things were happening. I'm trying my best to explain this in a way that's easy to follow and keep it short. If I described each thing in my home, I'd be typing for days. I found things out of place where I know I didn't place them. I noticed locks on my old windows are broken. Dish liquid bottle is broken. This weird ass oily substance on random shit. <laughs> on my curling iron in the bathroom. So, later on, I take the trash out of the dumpster in the alley. When I lift the lid, I see some types of handmade tools. Homemade. It's a short metal rod with a washcloth tied around the edge with a blue doctor's type glove on the end. I realized this is what the person used on my door to try and pry the lock. God, what else have they done? I look in the trash. I look in my neighbor's dumpster too, just out of curiosity. What I found made my heart sink. In their trash bag was my belongings, the most random stuff, my title to my old car, which was in a duffel bag in my top closet, clothes, makeup, household items. At this time, the man and woman who live next to me start arguing loudly. She walks out and across to the street. He is standing in his doorway, giving me a death look. I was annoyed, but also in fear. Coming to the realization that people have been in my home. I look up to him. I say, I know you've been in here. His response, I didn't steal a thing with a smirk. A quick description. A shirtless, fat, redneck, old white guy. I'm losing it. The words slip out of my mouth. I'm going to burn your house down. Bloody hell. My mind is racing. Thinking of all the things that are out of place. My dishwasher bottle was broken. Because it sits on the sink. Below a window. They break it coming through my window. They've been in here multiple times. Cut the chase. I call the cops. They came out. Talk to my neighbors and leave. After they leave, the man is out by my back door on the phone with someone smiling. Not 10 minutes later, about five cars pull up. Full of people. A big truck pulls behind my truck and blocks it in. 
a white guy with a tank top on and gold chains around his neck gets out. He's got a gun. I shove a chair against my back door and see the people head in for it. I scream for my boyfriend, grab my daughter and run as fast as I can out the front door. At this time, there's also people coming around the side of the home. I hear a big pop, they've shot. I almost fell off my porch. All I could do is yell, please no. And we're running down the street. I'm holding my daughter who's laughing because she doesn't know what's happening. I know I'm about to get shot. I know I'm going to get gunned down on the street somehow, but we make it to a corner and don't die. We called the police again. They searched and found no bullets. Took statements from my neighbours, and I asked them to stay for a moment while I went in the home to grab some clothes. And sure as hell, we're not staying there tonight. When I grab the clothes and diapers, I see an empty gallon of weed killer in my daughter's room. Now in the time it took us to run, wait on the cops and come back, they re-entered my home again, poured weed killer everywhere. Now I gathered up everything I could and left, but nothing ever come of this, no arrests. This time I went back to get the rest of my belongings. I have zero questions to my answers, and I still have nightmares about this. Basically, me and my friend are on our way to an urbex location, smoking a fat blunt, when a car pulls up to us. Three people in it ask us if we know any abandoned buildings in the area. So we tell them about the one we're thinking about going to, thinking nothing of it. We first go check out another location, but that turns out to have been taken down. So we move to our original target. Now given some context, both me and my friend wear disturbing masks to keep our identity safe warding off any potential attackers. We completely forget about the possibility of the other group being there. So me and my friend basically get to this abandoned hotel, start messing around. We're setting up a picture because now we like taking creepy pictures of each other. So he sits himself in a corner and I go behind the front desk wearing my mask. All of a sudden, we both see a beam of light as it hits my face, then hear three screams, the three people bolting it out of there. Instead of being mature, <laughs> me and my friend just quickly glance at each other <laughs> without thinking run after them. <laughs> I'm pretty sure one of them was an Olympic sprinter, because I've never seen anyone run as fast as I did that night. This was all at 2am in an abandoned hotel that's about 3 miles away from the nearest road. That's so something I would do. Hey guys, I'm an 18 year old and I currently live in Egypt. I'm half Egyptian and I moved here 2 years ago, so I don't really know how to deal with people in here. By people I mean troublemakers. The place I live in is pretty decent and I go to school so I never had to encounter any troublemakers. My dad travels a lot since I'm the oldest of my siblings. I do most of the shopping so I get the groceries and almost everything from big malls. One day my hour trip turned into a nightmare. I drive a good car, not a sports car or a supercar but a pretty good car for an average youngster in the Middle East. About three weeks ago, I had a list of groceries to grab, so I went to the mall and did shopping, and paid for it and got out. 
I decided to try that new vegan burger that I see every day on Facebook and got one. I got a soda, fries as well and started walking to the parking lot. I see this kid who I thought was 15ish. He looks pretty homeless to me and I decided to give him my fries. So I dropped the bag from my back seat and I was even thinking of talking to him, maybe to hear his story. I thought helping him would just be harmless but it turned out to be quite the opposite. I got over to him to shake his hand and I asked him what you're doing out here man and he said he was on his way to the village but lost his money. Now a lot of people out here warned me that this is a scam but I felt really like he was in a bad situation so I asked more. Where do you live? What do you do for a living? Are you in school? What are you doing in this city? He said that he's working with someone and he sells stuff on the street and he sold goods but he lost his money. I felt really bad for him so I offered him a ride to the bus station and enough money to get him where he wanted to go. Even though it wasn't much, it would be enough for a ticket and some change. I didn't feel anxious at all to the point where I told him about my private life. Before I head out, the mall security comes and asks me if he's causing trouble and I said nah man, he's alright. It was disgusting for this guy to assume that this poor guy was a bad person I thought in my head. We head out and I share my burger with him and I even gave him a soda. He starts guiding me through the road. Everything was fine until he asked me to turn off to a dirt road. Now I don't really know where the bus station is, but I knew for sure it wasn't there, and I told him I'd just check it on my phone, and he said that's fine. But I was starting to question the story in my head. I was relieved that he didn't insist. He said, oh it's not that far. Great, but still I was certain that a public bus station would be public and he wouldn't be able to do anything, right? What made me really suspicious was a phone call he made. He called someone and he said, Hey, X, meet me at the one below the bridge. I got the goods. Now, I was like, what's he on about? I don't see any goods. Before I arrive, I said, sorry it's so dark, but you can walk there and I'll drop you off here. He said, yeah, that's all right, and sighed. He called the guy again and told him he'll be out on the road and that he's in a white SUV. I was so anxious at this point. We arrive and Jesus Christ, what happened next was the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. When we got there, I saw seven guys who were obviously looking for me. Now it was a highway, so I thought switching to the last lane would allow... Wait, there's also a group of people on the other side. Now this is a highway, so I thought I could just switch lanes. But wait, <laughs> there's also a group of people on the other side now. I even notice that one of them has a stick or something sharp on them. They start waving something at me. I got into the middle lane and gassed it out there. They were shouting and running after me. I look at him and say if you don't want to drop you off here, I can only drop you at the police station, which was the only other way, and he told me to just drop him there. I said okay, but make it fast. He gets out and I get the hell out of there. I don't know what would have happened if they had caught me. They might have mugged me, or maybe it was something to do with drug dealing. Maybe they could have kidnapped me. I don't know what would have happened. Sorry for my bad English. As I said, I'm Egyptian. I live in an apartment complex with my husband and 13 month old baby in a bad area of my city. My husband was at work. He finishes around 11 most days, and I kept hearing strange noises from my nearby balcony. I turned the porch light on, expecting to see a stranger with a toothy grin and a knife in hand. Instead, I saw no one going back to what I was doing. Again, I heard a strange noise and nervously checked. Nobody. Nothing. I thought to myself that it was just my neighbours outside that I was probably just overreacting to them sliding the door shut or something, turning the light on, turning it on again, etc. So I come back inside, shove some headphones into my ear, and stop frightening myself. This worked beautifully, and I forgot all about the sound I heard. 
scientifically, at ten, I take a bath and prepare my mind for slumber. I got caught up in something on the internet though, and ended up not getting up from my kitchen until before 10pm. Around that time, I rose to the bath. I then hear a pounding sound outside my door. I glance through the peephole and saw no one. I can only see the other apartment out of the peephole. However, since I'm nosy, I decide to wait until I can see this person. They're now pounding really hard. It's actually shaking my door. Now after about 8 minutes or so, the pounding stops. I wait. Still no one. The neighbours hadn't answered their door either. The silence continues for maybe 5 minutes or a couple of minutes after I walked away. It began again. This time, it sounded like it's on my door. Now I'm a very anxious person. I do not like being alone in my apartment at night and I refuse to open the door if I absolutely don't have to at night. I cautiously look through the peephole and see nothing. This terrifies me. I messaged my husband and he told me to call our security. Now at this point, the pounding gets louder and louder. I'm absolutely terrified. This went on for some time. I stared out my door's peephole, wondering what's going on as I try to rationalise what's happening. Maybe someone's actually knocking on my neighbour's door and it just sounds like they're knocking on mine. Maybe someone's locked outside and pounding on the door. Then, my thoughts are disrupted as somebody begins to scratch on my door. Now my apartment door is metal, so I distinctly hear the sound of the person's nails running across it. I glance out the peephole, terrified at which creature I might discover. Though again, no human in sight. I then thought that I should go to the closet in my bedroom to call security. Away from the front door, but right as I was about to walk away, I saw something through the peephole that made me gasp. I saw a man slowly stand up. I've never seen him before. I couldn't see him prior to standing because the peephole doesn't see that far downwards. I'm pretty sure that he was crouching down, waiting for me to open my door to see what the hell was happening and attack me. I'm so glad that I didn't. It was my senior year of high school. I finally made some good friends and used to clog up my parents' landline and just stand outside on the phone talking away. We had a ranch style house with a fairly long driveway and across the street from my home was one giant field. There was a mansion that a local doctor owned far back in the field. But more or less, if you stood on the driveway to my home looking across the street, there was nothing but empty fields as far as you could see. At the end of the driveway is our mailbox, of which stood next to the only street light on the block. So one night, I'm standing at the end of my driveway, talking on my phone to a friend, and my mother kept popping her head out to the front door, complaining for me to get off the phone and come inside. It's late. I just told her five minutes multiple times and kept speaking. I then remembered complaining to my friend about her and how annoyed I was. Now at some point, I heard my name being called again, only now, it's a loud whisper, like, 
when you're quietly trying to get someone's attention. I distinctly remember saying to my friend, oh god she's yelling at me again, and kept talking. A few moments later, I hear my name being called again. I ignore it, kept on talking. Again, a few moments later, also heard come over here. I turn around and realise the front door isn't closed. I know, I thought it was odd, but not enough to register anything to change what I was doing. I continued talking for a while, then said goodbye and headed in. I get inside. My parents had just gotten in bed. I complained to my mum that she didn't have to keep yelling at me that she should have just let me finish my call, etc. To which she responded, she hadn't come outside in about an hour. Cut two hours later. It's around 2am. I was in my room watching Evil Dead, and I get up, headed to the kitchen to make ramen. My mum, who had heard me in the kitchen, yelled at me from the bedroom to make sure the front doors are locked before I go to bed. I walk out of the kitchen, heading to the front door, making sure it's locked. The front door was one of those that had an oval of frosted glass in the centre, so that you could look through it clearly in tiny sections. Others are frosted, so you can't. So anyway, I did what I normally do and look through one of the tiny clear sections towards the street lamp at the end of the driveway. Kind of like when you go close to the blinds, you look outside every so often. However, I couldn't see the street lamp. Now for a split second, I thought maybe the lights went out until whomever was outside on the other side of the glass moves to the side. I sprinted out of there to my parents' room, waking my dad up, yelling at him what had happened. He got out of bed with my mum, grabs a bat, rushes outside but doesn't find anything. He turned on all the lights, nothing. Creeped out, I go back to bed. Next morning, I wake up and head to my car for school. The driver's side door was slightly ajar. I figured I just moronically left it open or something the night before and got in. As the school ends, I got home to find a police car in my driveway. Apparently someone's broke into our garage overnight and stole all my dad's tools and everything else. Not only that, he's robbed several other homes and assaulted people. It was scary to realise whoever it was was literally hiding around my home, baiting me while I was on the phone, and then hours later was still outside there staring in through the front door. This happened around 10 years ago, in 2008 or 2009. I was visiting my grandmother in a rural section of the Lake of Ozarks, near a small town with a hilarious name where I went to high school. I was very familiar with the area, and when visiting my grandmother, I would often walk into town, taking backward trails until I reached the main road going into town. Very rarely, someone would stop and offer a ride and normally I would accept. It's a small town in a rural area, where everyone mostly knows everyone else. So I wouldn't even look up until I was getting in the vehicle. I stopped accepting rides after this. I had just come out of the woods and was walking along the side of the road. I was maybe a mile or two out of the town and enjoying my walk. An older blue Ford Taurus pulls up next to me. The driver rolls down the passenger window, need a ride, and starts to walk over. 
I get in and get a good look at my driver. The man looked like a greasier version of Charles Manson. Flat, stringy brown hair that looked like it hadn't been washed in a week, and it came down to his jawline. He had salt and pepper five o'clock shadow and piercings. Wild blue eyes. Something about him rang every alarm bell in my body, and I went to get back out of the car, but we were already in motion. Instead, I begin to look around the vehicle. The front is relatively normal, and even clean. The back seat is covered with a blanket. On top of the blanket is something that takes up nearly the entire back seat, wrapped in a tarp. Whatever it is stands about five and a half foot off the back seat. On top of all this is a big, black, shaggy dog that is staring right through me. The question snapped me back to the front seat. I'm sorry, what? I asked. He's staring at me instead of the road. What are you doing here? Oh, I say, laughing a little out of nervousness. I'm visiting my grandmother. I live in a college town about 90 miles from here, and I'm on my way to see some old friends. He frowns. No, he says flatly. Why are you here? I frown a little. Everything inside me is flashing, get out, get out, get out, get out now. Uh, I just told you, I mumble. My tension is rising visibly. The dog gives a low growl from the back seat. We are passing the sign for a country line. There is a gas station coming up that marks the beginning of the town. He's still staring at me. Why are you here? Why on earth are you here? He screams out of nowhere, slamming his hands on the steering wheel. I'm huddled against the door, shaking. He pulls into the gas station. Give me your glasses. Statement, no question. No emotion. Without question, I hand them over. Wait here. He goes into the store. I'm frozen in place, shaking and trying to will my arms or legs to work, trying to stop breathing again. I know whatever the hell is going on, I need out, fast. The dog gave another low growl and that snapped me into action. I get up, almost rolling out of the car. Shakily I walk into the store and in an equally shaky voice say to the guy, this is close enough to where I'm going, I would like my glasses now please. My eyesight is very poor but I feel the intensity of the glare he gave me. I think the cashier could too, because she took a couple of steps back, close to the store phone. Silently, he hands me the glasses, continues to set daggers at me as I put them on, and walks out the store without saying another word to either of us. The cashier stares at me, clearly freaked out. What was that? she asks. The adrenaline of the situation has started to wear off, and the real gravity started to sink in for me. Tears are beginning to silently course down my face. Can I use your phone, please? I ask her. She nods and wordlessly hands it to me with a box of tissues. She tells me I can go into the manager's office to make my phone call and take as much time as I want. I thank her, go back, and let my friends know what just happened. I also tell them I'll be cutting through the woods to get them because I don't want to see this guy ever again and that I'll be coming out behind the house. I took a few minutes to breathe and relax after I hung up. When I went back out, the cashier asked if I was okay and if there was anything she could do for me. I thanked her and again told her no. I asked if she knew the guy, she had never seen him before, and she didn't think he's from the area. That shook me even more. I give her my friend's phone number and ask her to call them if he comes back. I left and cut through the woods to my friend's house. We had a great afternoon, and when I was ready to leave, they gave me a ride home. At the time, it didn't bother me as much, but the longer I've had to think about it, the more curious I am about the back seat. That dog wasn't moving much from the top of it, unless the guy told him to. I tried not to think about what was under that tarp too much. It looked like someone lying in a fetal position from behind. And just for a side note, I am a 6 foot 1 male that was about 210 pounds at the time. I wore my head down to my waist with a full beard. I myself was a little intimidating, and would occasionally accidentally scare people just from my appearance. The aura this man gave off was terrifying, and there was no question he could have overpowered me. So back in the late 80s, the company I worked for was running security cables in the old tariff building down by the Wall Street Wall statue. 
I was with my foreman at the end of the day and he wanted me to show him what we did to the building. So we go down there and the stairwell door opens into a T corridor, say going left or right. Our job was directly to the left, so we turn and go this way. I stop with him because we see a guy at the other end of the corridor about 200 feet away. All we could see was a guy wearing a blue jumpsuit, like mechanist wear and a blue hard hat. We're curious as to why somebody's went down there, especially at this time. So I show him what we did on the left side and we go back. Now there's no sign of the guy. We were right by the stairway door. So we go down the corridor to where the guy was standing. It's a dead end. Where the hell could he have went? Why was he here this late at night? He was so silent too. We go upstairs where the security guards are. I mean, we're freaking out a bit at this point. We say, is there anyone else working in the building? The guard goes, no wire. My foreman says, we just saw someone down in the basement and before he could say another word, the guard goes in a blue hard hat. We both look at each other. The guard opens up a drawer, a big filing cabinet drawer full of these old pictures and these old workers. He tells us to write down what we saw. I ask him what it is. He says, that guy has been sighted since the 1940s. Penhurst in Spring City, PA, around June of 2013, if I remember correctly. There's a series of tunnels and sub-tunnels that connect all the buildings together underground. We're both standing in the tunnel entrance, which used to be a cafeteria called Dietary now. So the basement to the building had double doors. One of them is vaulted shut, other wide open. The basement was lit from foundation windows to near daylight. The three of us are facing each other in a sort of triangle, talking three feet to the left of the store. Now, besides our headlamps, the only light is from the room and the tunnel is a total darkness. Out of the corner of my eye, the next room appears to go dark. It's so sudden, I go silent. Now, what was the scariest part of this was that I quickly realised that they also went silent. I turn my head. There's a black silhouette vaguely resembling a person in the doorway, except they're much larger and more distorted than any normal human would ever be. Almost incomparable, I mean taking up the entire doorway. As I sit here and look at whatever this thing is, my headlamp goes completely absorbed by it. I can see the daylight through the basement behind it now as I turn my head to say what the hell. My friends had already started running as they also saw it. The one had a direct view of it, just said it kind of materialized in the doorway. I ran until I couldn't run anymore. The energy in the moment just seemed to completely leave me and my legs felt rubbery. I looked right at this thing just feet above me. My light did nothing. I was always so skeptical of such things prior to this. I've been up and down the east coast, across the country, my friends too but I've never experienced anything even close to this. God knows what happened that day.
I'll just give you a bit of background. I'm female and drive for lift at night. I'm on the shorter side, about five feet four. And have been driving for nearly six months. I tend to drive downtown Denver, especially on weekends where there's most money to make. In this time, I've only had a couple of truly scary encounters and I drive seven nights a week, at least a couple of hours a night. The first scary one started out normal enough for the late night ride that I was doing. I just dropped off a passenger in Aurora and was marking my way back towards Market Street since the bars hadn't closed yet. I get a pickup. It's on the way. It's a nice area that I don't feel uncomfortable in, but everyone knows Aurora CO knows it's really not the best area. Even with a few nicer places there. A couple of guys hop in, one in the front, one in the back. Now they have hoodies and are carrying backpacks, but it's Colorado and it's almost two in the morning, so not too odd. It gets odd after they first get in. I give my normal greeting, but they completely ignore me, shoving their backpacks onto the floor, pulling their hoodies up, shielding their faces from the windows with their hands. I instantly get uncomfortable and feel something's off. It was only a 10 minute drive and we're in a secluded area. So I decided that the safest thing I can do is complete the ride. I can feel my fight or flight kicking in. Within about a minute, I had decided if they were trying anything on, I was going to crash my car. Neither one had put on a seatbelt, so I figure that's the best chance I have. Once they arrive at location, they wanted to be dropped off, but I could tell it's not a good area. Bars with all the windows smashed, cars in disrepair and whatnot. They get out, but don't shut my doors beginning to whisper to each other, or glancing at me. One of them has his hand in his pocket, fidgeting with something. At this point, I've had enough, and step on the gas, driving with the doors open. I drove for a couple of miles, until I get to a gas station with lights and people before I start to properly close both doors. I call it a night and head it home to cuddle my toddler and husband before having a good cry in the safety of my own bed. I have no idea what they're planning to do, but I know I was terrified from the moment they pulled their hoods up and the moment I drove off with my doors open. The second story takes place a couple of weeks after the first. I had sworn off all pickups in Aurora and the shady parts at night. I would still drop people off there but I'd also turn off my app and leave the area when I was done. I was downtown as usual for a Saturday night. Bars were closing. I get a shared ride which can be very good at bar closing. Now the thing to know about shared rides is that you can't request more than two seats leaving room for two more people. Now I have on multiple occasions had a car with these types of rides full of people. I get to the person and unlock my doors as normal and get three people in. Okay, small problem. 
I'm polite and say I can't give them a ride with three people, so they'll have to order a different lift. This is when the one guy turns. I don't want to pay more, he says. I say I'm sorry, but either one of you has to get out, or all of you do, and you need to order a different ride. This is a shared ride and means I could get two more passengers and they need the seats. With shared rides, you're only allowed to book two seats for two passengers. The guy says, I'm not paying more, so you can just ignore other rides and take us home. At this point, you become aggressive and was putting his finger in my face. Now maybe I should have been more scared. But this is only Market Street at a bar close and it's packed. There's drunk people everywhere. And where there's drunk people, there's cops. I roll my window down as he continues to tell me where I'm going to drive and what I'm going to do. and threatening to hurt me. He's saying that he's really going to put me in pain if I don't stop right now. I didn't catch the whole sentence, but I made eye contact with a cop and just focused on getting his attention. Me, okay, you got a new choice. You can all get out or the cop can make you do it. The cop is now making his way over after seeing something's wrong. They all jump out and the guy's flipping me off and they disappear running. The cop says, am I okay? Ask him for a short rundown of what happened. He then heads off to try and find them. I report both of them. I now carry a foam pepper spray in my defense. And I also have a dash cam. But I know if stuff gets real, that's probably not ever going to protect me fully. This was about three years ago, on a dark stretch of road, near a main intersection in a major Bay Area city. I worked at a big name, healthy grocery store from 2014 to 2017. I was lucky to meet and work with amazing co-workers, some of whom have become my best friends and closest friends. One of my best friends, at the time and to this day, Cav, is one of the nicest, most caring people I've ever met. He is incredibly generous, genuine, and warm and welcoming to everyone, sometimes to a fault. At the time of this story, I'm a woman in my early 20s, and Cav is a guy in his late 20s. Cav and I have a weekly ritual of driving around the city after work and talking, sometimes about our problems, sometimes about what was going well, but it was therapeutic and always something to look forward to. One particular night, we invited our buddy Ben to join us. His department always got out 30 to 45 minutes after the rest of the store, so Cav and I would always take a short drive around the area to pass the time until Ben was off. Cav was driving that night. We did our drive and headed back to the store to pick up Ben. I order and get back to the store. We need to make a U-turn at a four-way intersection. To get to the intersection, we have to go down a dark but short stretch of road. There are no street lights for some reason. The intersection is well lit, always busy, and has shopping centre plazas on each side. From the dark stretch of road, it is exactly 302 feet, according to Google Maps, to the main, well lit, and ever busy intersection. We're driving down a dark section. Cav suddenly interrupts what I was saying and says, Oh my god, did you see that person waving? He slows down the car to take a look. No, what are you talking about? You didn't see them. There was someone in a black hoodie waving us down. I'm looking back. I have very poor eyesight, and it's dark. No, I don't see anyone. There's no one there. As I'm saying this, Cav is pulling into the empty parking lot parallel to the dark stretch of road. He reaches to the back seat, and is moving jackets and other stuff off the back seat, obviously making room for this person. No, Cav, I said. No one's getting in this car, do you understand? But what if they need- No! There's no one there. And if there were, they'd have to walk up the intersection. No. He agrees, but insists we continue to circle around and check. I reluctantly agree, but realise I have no choice. We circle back, and sure enough, there's a girl, my age in her early 20s, standing alone, wearing all black. She has a hoodie on. 
She looks like she's sort of crying. Maybe. Cav rolls down the passenger window, my window, down halfway, to which I roll it up another quarter of the way, and he asks her if she's okay. She seems... off, and I immediately have awful vibes from her. Four guys stole my purse, she says with her hands on her face. It had my wallet. I literally lost everything, and I don't have a phone. The weirdest thing about this is that she wasn't crying. She was stretching her words out and whining, but she wasn't crying. I said, alright, we'll call the police for you. Why don't you walk up to the well-lit plaza and we'll walk up with you to the police. No, she said adamantly. It won't help. I already called the police an hour ago. This is when I started to freak out. She just said she didn't have a phone. She's been standing in the dark for an hour. I thought you didn't have a phone, I said. I do, I do, it's dead. All of this is happening rapid fire. And before I can really mentally get into what's going on, Kaz tells her to get in the car so we can help her. I say, walk up to the plaza at the intersection and we'll help you. Cav unlocks the door and says, nah, don't worry, we'll drive you there. The girl has her hands in her front pockets of her hoodie and gets in the car. I'm fuming. This girl was acting super weird. I remember at this point that I had my box cut around me. I reached down into my backpack and am rummaging through the crap to find it. Cav is talking to her, but everything she says is contradictory. She says that she isn't from the area, and has no idea where she is, yet she tells us that she grew up and lives six blocks away. As we're driving, she says she wants to go to a particular bar, that she could really use a drink. I thought you didn't have your wallet or ID, I ask. I keep looking for my box car, and I'm looking back at her. She has a waxy complexion, and looks into my eyes as if she's looking through me. It gives me the creeps. Cav is incredibly kind to her, he's being an idiot and keep saying positive things, trying to get to the bottom of what's going on. While this is happening, I find my box cutter, I open it all the way, and hold it on my lap. I turn back and keep my eyes on her. She tells us that she has a boyfriend nearby, and asks us to take her there. She and Cav continue to talk, and she says she was kicked out of her parents' house. Her hands still remain in her pocket, and mine remains holding the box cutter. Because of this whole ordeal, we've totally forgotten about Ben. Still watching her, I pull my phone out and call him. I'm explaining to Ben what's happening, and in a matter of seconds, she went from asking us for money and alcohol, to saying weird stuff and wanting to get out of the car. We did not drop her at her boyfriend's house, but a few streets away apparently, in a random neighbourhood. We drop her off and there's silence for a few seconds in the car. Oh my god, Cav says laughing, she could have robbed or killed us. Yeah, you idiot. I'm 100% certain of that, and at the very least, she was planning to rob us. Looking back, there was so much I could have done differently, like calling the cops right away. We're lucky that nothing happened, but I'm positive that there was evil in the car that night.